With massive layoffs in nearly every sector, weakness in manufacturing, car sales and housing, and the biggest one-month decline in the trade deficit since the financial crisis, the economic picture is not looking good, which might explain why so many billionaires are loading up on gold, including hedge fund manager John Paulson and real estate mogul Sam Zell. Bottom line, now is the time to own gold, which is why the experts at Stansbury Research just stepped forward with a major gold prediction, arguing gold could soar as high as $3,000 by the end of the year, possibly even higher. You can find out why and get instant access to their number one gold investment today. It's not bullion, an ETF, or a mining stock. But in the past, this gold strategy could have made you nearly 50x your money. Considering how quickly the price of gold has been moving in recent weeks, you don't want to waste any time missing out on the gains these experts believe are in store for this gold stock. To get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to goldmaniareport.com. Again, that's goldmaniareport.com for a free copy of his new report. Hi, this is Daniela Cambone, editor-at-large for Stansbury Research, here at the New York Stock Exchange for a very special interview uh, with someone who is obviously no stranger to the industry. He's a very successful businessman, philanthropist, art collector, and he joins me here today to talk about a variety of topics about everything going on in the world. Uh, Tom, it's so nice to be with you. Welcome to the show, Thomas Kaplan. Thank you very much for having me back, Daniela. Yes, absolutely. Like I said, we have so many things to touch uh, base on today with everything going on, but obviously I want to talk about uh, Nova Gold, Electrum. But let's just start, since it's been a while since our last conversation, to get your outlook on the current state of the world today? Well, uh, I would say that, very simply put, we are probably in the most challenging environment from a geopolitical standpoint that we have seen since the end of the Second World War. There are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, we have a number of clearly very dissatisfied powers, such as Russia, China, Iran, Turkey. We have the developing world having endured multiple shocks from the financial crisis and COVID. The developing world has uh, a food issue uh, that is looming. Um, I don't want to be a doom and gloom say it's uh, already enough that I think everyone who's watching television understands that uh, we're very much in uncharted waters. Right, right. I understand it's it's a loaded question. What's interesting to me is I feel, and let me know if you agree with me or not, is I feel there's, there's a shift that's about to happen. Um, we see uh, the power of the BRICS, and perhaps you agree with me or not, rising, right, via V. Um, the power that America holds. So I want to talk to you about that. But first, let's start with gold. What's your take on, on gold right now? Uh, I would begin by saying that the vast majority of mankind is uh, experiencing gold at all-time highs. And even against the almighty dollar, gold has performed extremely well. So whereas... Um, I'm used to people saying at certain inflection points, why hasn't gold done better? I think the truth is that gold has done a spectacular job of preserving people's wealth. Pretty much every Indian who's owned gold since the dawn of mankind has found that he's been able to preserve his wealth in that fashion. Similarly, the Chinese. Similarly, the British. Um, I could go on, but essentially gold is in a bull market against all currencies, and in that I include the dollar. If you take a look at a long-term price chart of gold, you'll see against the dollar that gold is consolidating um, and coiling for the next up leg in the bull market, the one that will take it convincingly past 2000 and to the higher equilibrium range that I see. That's in dollar terms. The truth is that gold is rising in a global environment. So in other words, if we do talk about the BRICS, if we do understand 
that the U.S. dollar is the home currency mm -hmm. of only roughly 5% of the world, then you have to look at things uh, through a different lens. And if you do believe that we are dealing in a different world, then the truth is that gold is poised to probably be the safest asset out there. So let's break that down a little bit because, you know, investors will call me exactly saying what you, you've said. I'm so frustrated by mm. gold. Why isn't it above uh, 2000? I've been hearing this for the longest time, but I'm excited to speak with you today, Tom, because you are a historian in the truest sense of the word. You, you know, not only hold bachelor's, master's, doctorates in history from Oxford. So I'd like you to help us debunk some myths specifically surrounding the gold market, because as you know, there's a lot of myths. Well, again, I'd like to, I'd like to go back and to create a certain context. So there are a number of myths about gold. And I'll give you an anecdote from my own Please. life experience that highlights just how the perception and the reality of those myths play out. In, in November of 2007, my family sold what was then probably the fastest growing privately owned natural gas producer in the United States. Timing was extremely fortunate. The price of oil had hit $100. The same people who were telling me when we created an energy company a number of years earlier, and the price of oil was at $18, mm -hmm. that it was going to go back to a normative 12 to 15, maybe even under 10 again. Um, and I saw it going to 100. And so when it did hit 100, we'd made 100 times our money through exploration success and rising hydrocarbon prices, and we decided to sell. Now, when we received that wire transfer, there were several things which we need to remember. First, dollar euro was 146. Mm. The price of gold had a six handle, 600 something. The price of gold is nearly triple and dollar euro is at parity. The price of oil, was at around $100 a barrel. It's now $80, $85 a barrel. Again, price of gold was about a third of where it is today. There was no inflation, and yet gold tripled. Mm. So when you look at the various mythologies that people harbor about gold, that you need inflation, right. it's not true. Right. That you need a, a weak dollar, right. not true. That it's just a commodity like oil, again, not true. And you also have to take into account that central banks at that time were not buyers of gold, whereas now they are. And if there's one thing that we've learned is that the central bankers, more than anyone else, are the equivalent of insider buying. Exactly. Because no one knows better than they do the weakness, the fragility, the counterparty risk that they have in all the other assets that they've been acquiring, in many cases under duress because we're in uncharted waters in terms of monetary policy and in terms of being able to keep the global economy afloat. So from all these aspects, I look at gold and I say that it's the best myth buster that there is in the world. And again, people will say, well, how come it hasn't done better? I always hear this before gold is going to make a major push upwards. When this consolidation is over, when this pullback is over, and it is a pullback within a bull market, that price chart of gold is wildly bullish. When that ends, I think that we're going to see the next breakthrough, a lot of which, by the way, um, is going to be lubricated by the crypto narrative. Because what the crypto narrative has done is it's made a lot of the arguments that I used to have to make on the virtue of owning an asset that isn't someone else's liability, owning a currency that can't be printed by fiat, mm. um, it's made that argument redundant. Everyone now accepts that. Hence, 
the moniker that crypto was given of gold 2.0. Well, turns out that gold 1.0 is pretty, pretty great. So a lot of important points and brilliantly said, and that's why I was nodding so much. Let's break it down. From what I'm hearing from you, you don't like when gold is placed in a box. This is how it should behave in this, this, this situation, correct? It's not a function of whether I like it or not. Um, you know, I suppose that we always have to remember that those people who are bullish on gold, despite the fact that, as I've just said, it works well without inflation, it works well against commodities, it works well against the dollar. We're still called bugs gold bugs. I think it's probably the only asset in the world where when you are bullish, you are referred to as an insect. And so it's not <laughs> a question of whether or not I like to put gold into a box or that I resent other people right, doing it. Right. It's that they're demonstrably incorrect historically. And so let's hone in on the point about central banks, because this is an important one. 400 tons in Q3 were purchased by central banks we do not know where a lot of that gold or from who was purchasing. We have our suspicions, of course, that it was Russia and China. But the bigger part of it, I think you hit on, Tom, is why are they buying so much? We haven't seen this amount of buying since the 80s. What do they know that we don't about what's coming? It's not what they know. It's what we also know, but seem to resist understanding or embracing. Mm. It's basically called cognitive dissonance. We understand that we're looking at a world that is wildly challenging, but those who are on the front lines of the financial markets, such as central bankers, also understand that we've now crossed into a certain kind of twilight zone. If someone had said last year that a great deal of Russia's foreign currency could be sterilized just like that. Right. Um, people would have said, well, that's probably a step that won't be taken by other authorities because it sets a precedent. So many precedents have been broken over the last decade that we should understand that the central banks are looking around and they're saying, what is it that when you own it, does not represent something that can be seized, that um, will still maintain value, and after all, is historically the most important reserve asset that central banks owned up until the dollar was taken off that, uh, that standard and was considered to be as good as gold. Do you think it's interesting that the new countries that have emerged as buyers, Uzbekistan, Poland's buying more, is that of interest to you? Of course. What does that tell us? Well, you know, 60% of the reserves of Western central banks or developed country central banks um, are in uh, gold, whereas it's probably 5% for the developing world. And in that, I would also include China, mm -hmm. by the way. So they have a long way to go in order to be able to catch up. But look, they're surveying the environment. And what they see is that it's very easy to hold you hostage. So why not own something that we know is going to maintain its value and smartly repatriate it back to the home country? Okay, but please help me understand this because I have yet to, to find an answer. If Russia and China are buying the gold, right? Mm. Why would China, why are they not telling us the numbers? Because in a way, those who hold the gold, I mean, the US is the largest gold, uh, gold holder in the world, the central bank holdings. It's, it's, it's a power play, it shows strength of a country. Why would China not want to reveal how much gold they have, or they only give out the numbers every so whatever amount of years, why? First of all, I don't believe the Chinese are telling the truth as to what they really own. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but if you're accumulating a position in a stock, you don't tell someone every time you're buying blocks of shares. All that does is create front running. So if you're the Chinese, do you really want to advertise to the world that you're in the market? You 
suppress that information. You keep it as low key as possible. You disperse the holdings that you've obviously been acquiring into different pockets so that when you do have to make disclosures about what you own, they seem to be relatively small and modest in terms of the increases. China is the largest producer of gold mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. They're also one of the largest importers of gold in the world. So that has to be going somewhere. So unless the Chinese retail market is far more developed in its infrastructure and plumbing than I'm aware of, right, right. it's going into the official sector. And if I were the Chinese, I wouldn't be advertising that. I, and I certainly wouldn't be going to Goldman Sachs and saying, here's an order for you know, 10 million ounces, 20 million ounces of gold. You wouldn't do that. You would try to accumulate it as elegantly as possible. Now, if someone were to ask me if Russia went to China and said, would you be willing to buy all of our gold reserves? We need right. the cash. That's a check I think the Chinese would write if they haven't already written it. Interesting. Because there is the theory that China is secretly accumulating all this gold and Russia because they're planning some sort of gold-backed currency, an alternative to the U.S. dollar. Have you given any thought to those theories? Of course. Um, and it would be natural for them to harbor those ambitions. They have witnessed up close and personal mm -hmm. what it means to be held hostage by the dollar system, by American sanctions. Now, I'm not saying that those things aren't justified. I'm simply saying that from their standpoints, they have a vulnerability. I don't believe that Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin want to have that vulnerability. And Putin has just been the biggest victim in the world right. of what you would call sequestration of assets. By the way, deservedly so, but that's not the point. The point is that if you see the United States as a rival, as a challenger, if you see yourself as having a countervailing political system and you are trying to achieve equality, if not ultimately supremacy in that global contest, of course you don't want to be held hostage to the dollar system. You wish to undermine it. You wish to get more people accepting your paper in exchange. So I have no doubt that the Chinese, and probably in concert with the Russians, are trying to figure out ways to be able to either undermine the dollar or create a, an alternative. They've suffered a big setback because of the blow to their collective prestige as a result of Ukraine. They had a much better chance of being able to pull this off if the Russians had managed mm. to march into Kyiv in 72 hours. The fact that the Ukrainians have pushed them back is a big blow to China and Russia, who clearly communicated about what was going to happen. I think, you know, the Russians basically promised they won't do anything before the closing ceremonies of the Olympics, and then they made their move. But in reality, all they've done is increase Western solidarity and contribute to the rise of the dollar. Interesting. Because as a historian, you'd be the first to educate us about the fact that not all empires last forever. So to that point, the U.S. dollar. The U.S. is obviously looking at the situation, looking at what Russia's doing, looking at what China's doing. Aren't they? Are they preparing? What are they doing to safeguard the dollar? Are they doing enough? They don't really care. We've long since abdicated a sense of responsibility with regard to our holding the world's reserve currency. 60% of reserves are now in the dollar. And when you look at the spending yeah. by Republicans, by Democrats, um, attempted even more spending by Democrats, and candidly, you know, the Republicans are just as guilty on this subject you see that the United States no longer considers the impact that ultimately the dollar will have on the rest of the world. It goes its own way. And at the end of the day, that's going to come back to haunt us because with the privilege of having the world's reserve currency goes with it responsibility. 
the United States is not proving itself to be a responsible steward of the global currency. I'm a little surprised to hear you say that, Tom, that the U.S. right now does not care about losing its reserve currency status? No. What I'm saying is they don't really care about the value of the dollar. Okay. So they do care about the reserve currency status, but they are not willing to show the kind of husbandry of the currency that over the long term will allow it to maintain its reserve currency status. So it wants the best of all worlds. It wants to jealously guard right. its reserve currency right. status without having to make any of the sacrifices necessary to be able to give people the long-term confidence. The reason why people gravitate to the dollar, the reason why I have not been a dollar bear right. for the last 10 or 15 years, yeah. um, is that we always have to remember that currencies, paper currencies are a relative instrument. So as I said, maybe a decade ago, um, in a world filled with uh, toilet tissue, the dollar is double ply <laughs> and it's proven to be right. Um, so when people get uh, challenged, they then start to look at the dollar versus other currencies. Well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the euro. The euro has fundamental flaws in its spending mechanisms, which may or may not survive another debt crisis, as we saw before. Uh, you don't have a Mario Draghi there who's in a position to say, um, we will do whatever mm -hmm. it takes. Mm -hmm. And everybody mm -hmm. says, whoa, mm -hmm. OK, yeah. we believe him. Yeah. My fear is that one day they will say that, or even the Americans will say that. Someone will say, we will do whatever it takes, and the market will continue taking the euro or the dollar down. And then there's no bottom, because it's all over printed paper. So would you agree that we are about to embark on a huge monetary reset? Ultimately, yes. The, the flavor that is finally adopted um, I can't say, except for one thing, gold will be the ultimate beneficiary. All currencies will be debased against gold for all of the macroeconomic, geopolitical, and speculative forces that have been unleashed over the last decade. Which brings me to my next point. Um, I started the interview by saying you're involved in a variety of sectors. You have passions, you know, ranging from wildlife conservation to, to your interest in art. Yet you chose gold, right? You started your career, well, at least in precious metals, silver, then you did platinum, hydrocarbon, gold. It's almost the enfant terrible of, of Wall Street gold. People don't yeah. really get it. What attracted you to gold? Why did you choose gold when you could have been in anything? Simply put, when I sold our energy company in 2007, um, I had already developed a conviction that I wanted to pivot away from hydrocarbons to precious metals. Again, um, oil was on its way to 100, 120. And uh, gold at the time was 500, 600. And that proved to be the right step. But the basic thinking was I wanted to be in a currency that couldn't be printed at will. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be um, in an asset class that I felt would do fine if the world did well but may be amongst the only things that does well if things go pear-shaped. And obviously, we've experienced since that time multiple speculative booms in a variety of other areas. But as an investor, I find that the ability to make money is very much a function of developing a thesis scrubbing that thesis to the point that you have massive conviction, finding the right assets that will allow you to benefit from the underlying theme 
more and more in a jurisdiction that will allow you to keep the fruits of that benefit and then having patience and riding it for as long as it takes. And I came to that conviction with gold. I came to that conviction with silver. And as a consequence, I've managed to be able to hold and build positions. Um, and I'm very comfortable with that. I'm more comfortable with it now than ever before. Has there been an opportunity cost in the intervening period? <laughs> Absolutely, except that I have no doubt that um, I would have been in over my head because I would have violated the fundamental rule, which is don't invest in something unless your conviction will allow you to survive the inevitable downdrafts. And you obviously have a passion and a belief for gold. I feel it from here. And going back to a breakout for gold, right? And going back to, you know, I know that things will change and there's no exact recipe of what it takes to let gold just take off. But we have this record central bank buying. We have less exploration happening, right? We're finding less gold. Everything seems to be perfectly aligned for gold to take off. Yeah, we can't seem to answer that question of why, why hasn't it? What's it going to take to get that lift off you speak of? What's it going to take? Is there something missing? First of all, and I, I don't mean to sound glib, but I believe it's a truism that gold will do what you least expect it to do when you least expect it to happen. And a very good example of that was during the global financial crisis, the price of gold went from around mm -hmm. six eighty seven hundred dollars back to six hundred yeah. at a time when everybody thought, "Why isn't everyone flooding into gold?" Right. And I said, "Look, gold is doing what it's meant to do. Um, most of the markets are all ask no bid, and gold is allowing people to make a relatively graceful exit when they need liquidity. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens when gold goes back over seven hundred, and it did." And then it went to around 800. And then people said, well, gold should be higher. Why isn't that at 1,000? And then eventually it got to 1,000. And why isn't gold higher? And then it went to 1,800. Usually the big moves in gold are preceded by people saying, why isn't it doing what I want it to do now? <laughs> and I'm sorry, gold just won't behave that way. Um, you can get companies to do that because there are certain things within your control. So you know the kind of news that you'll be issuing to a certain range of buyers. Gold is marching to a different beat, a different drummer. Um, but when people least expect it, gold will go back to 2000. People will say it's been here before. It'll go to 2050. People will say it's been here before. Then it'll go to 2100 and 2150. And people go, ooh, I'm going to buy it on a pullback. Then the pullback to 1950 comes and they're scared witless and they don't buy it on the pullback. And then it goes back to 23, 2400. They're paralyzed, et cetera, et cetera, until gold goes to what I expect to be the next equilibrium range of between three and 5,000. So this is over what kind of period? Next 10 years? Five? I would expect it to happen a lot sooner than that. Okay. I think that once this consolidation period is over and we see that next big move, it will happen much faster than people think. In the same way as you saw with other speculative instruments right, like right. crypto. And I want to get back to crypto a second. But does your timeline change depending on what the Fed will do with their monetary policy? No. Doesn't matter. No. What are the QE, no. tightening, out no. the window? Doesn't no. matter. No. I'll give you an example. Yeah. In the early 2000s, gold reached 250, roughly, yeah. what we call the Gordon Brown bottom. Over the next 12 years, what I call leg one of the bull market, gold went up every single year. During that time, you had periods of dollar strength, dollar weakness inflationary fears, deflationary fears, or at least disinflationary fears, um, strong commodities, weak commodities, geopolitical quiet, geopolitical tensions. Gold just went up. And my belief is that when this, what I would call second wave correction 
within the bull market is over, the next decade will see something relatively similar, albeit with greater volatility because the moves will be magnified. I have no problem envisaging that there will be trading days in which gold has a peak to trough trading range greater than the absolute price mm. it is right now. No problem seeing that. Mm. We will be dealing with a much, much more volatile climate. So based I, on, sorry, based on the, the, the context of the world or why that volatility? Because when gold establishes that new equilibrium right. range, it will be accompanied by tremendous volatility. And those who are trying to buy it right. are going to try to buy it in a very panicked way. That will likely be accentuated by um, many jurisdictions treating gold as a strategic asset and effectively nationalizing it. And so I think that we can expect that there'll be much more emotion in a market that when people get gold fever tends to be highly emotional in any event. And if you look at crypto, for example, right. Um, there were days, there have been days in which crypto traded in you know, peak to trough Absolutely. days as much as it was just a few years ago. I think gold will have the same because as interesting and as speculative um, yeah. as crypto was, there's nothing like gold fever. Right, right. I just can't see the DNA of gold being similar to that of Bitcoin. You know, it was John Paulson who uh, pointed out to me, and we made a joke out of it. We called it gold fever. Um, <laughs> when people get it, there's really nothing like it. And he had his own experiences with it when he was uh, a youth. And the truth is that, you know, he's not a gold bug. I'm not a gold right. bug. We see it as a store of wealth, a way to preserve wealth. Um, as uh, a great currency in its own right, but as a hedge against other things. But nonetheless, we are not immune to the fact that when people really want to own it, and remember, this is a brand which goes back a lot farther and is a lot more recognizable even than Coca-Cola and Apple. And when people want to own more of it, um, it becomes a very, very highly charged Gold story. Gold fever. I want to talk crypto just for a bit. Did you ever believe the narrative that money was flowing from gold into crypto? I didn't spend very, very much time analyzing it. In fact, I don't think I spent any time analyzing it um, because I thought that ultimately it would be irrelevant. Is it possible that it had an impact uh, during that period? Sure. But that will be seen to be vastly overwhelmed by the renewed interest that it created in that thesis right. that people like John Hathaway right. or, you know, my friends Ross, Bob, you know, and John Paulson. And we would talk about why you would want to own gold. Right. We no longer have to do that. It's done. The crypto world did that in a way that so vastly disseminated the narrative um, that when gold starts to rise, what you'll see is that the rising price begets its own momentum. Right. But the narrative is there. I'm not going to have to explain to somebody why they should want to own a currency that can't be printed. Because the youth, the young generation particularly, that bought into this at an earlier point, um, or I don't know, maybe at the climax, I have no idea, but they're already doing the job for us. And all we need is for gold to start making that move. I want to talk Nova Gold now. My passion. And, <laughs> your project. passion. Um, how many years now for you? 14. 14. Yes. Um, you haven't done a financing in over 10 years. How's that possible? The story of the financing in 2012 really was a very special one. It was the first informational roadshow which uh, Greg Lang and I undertook together when he came on board as CEO and I came on board as chairman. 
And despite the fact that there was a lot of skepticism about the ability to get federal permits, despite the lingering uh, ill will that some investors had towards um, the company prior to our getting involved, because we didn't own it until December 31st, 2008, mm -hmm. so long after Barrick's failed hostile takeover. Despite all of this, this was regarded as a special situation with a highly charged uh, management team that was highly professional. Greg Lang had been with Barrick and its predecessor companies for 30 years. Um, as we like to say, he was the opposite of promiscuous in the way that he mm -hmm. handled his career. Um, I uh, was known for having a focus on what we at Electrum would call category killer assets. By that, I mean assets that um, are so unusual in their attributes or combination of attributes that anyone would want to own it at a price. And I'd watched Nova Gold go from 50 cents or a dollar in the early 2000s to when Barrick made its hostile takeover mm -hmm. attempt and into the 20s. I didn't own a share on the way up. Um, I don't short stocks, so I didn't short anything on the way down. But we did come in as a white knight. And because it was like catching a falling knife, uh, there were only a couple of other investors who were intrepid enough to say, can we join you? Um, John Hathaway, um, Peter Palmetto, um, and they did. But we were clearly the lead. And I wanted to buy the entire company. I had the cash. We'd sold our energy company a year earlier. And uh, wiser voices prevailed, the late Igor Leventhal, um, whom I affectionately would call Misha, um, told me, as I had exhorted him, always remind me, thou art mortal, Caesar. And he managed to persuade me that what I was going to try to buy for a couple of hundred million dollars, um, all Barrick would have to do is walk me up dollar for dollar until I got to the point where I'd say, you know, uncle, Peter Monk, uncle. Um, and so he said, better to have 40% of something fabulous than zero because you want it all. Point noted. And we made that deal. You have to remember what it was like for Nova Gold at the end of 2008. This was like catching a falling knife. And very few fiduciaries were in a position to be able to jump on it. But because of our sale, our exit in hydrocarbons in 2007, I was armed with a lot of cash and a lot of conviction. And uh, I've noticed that in my case, that can often be a lethal combination. And so we struck and we did effectively a take under, but we saved the company from um, bankruptcy. And there were other companies who were waiting in the wings to buy it out of bankruptcy so they wouldn't have to deal but with all those. But you believed in it so completely. much, despite those completely. red flags. Completely. In fact, um, when my team said that they needed just a couple of weeks to do the due diligence, yeah. I told them, you have two days. <laughs> And they said, that's not possible. <laughs> and I said to the team who were looking at me quizzically, I said, I don't have to believe anything that Nova Gold says about Donlin. I have to believe Barrick. Mm. So now I've taken the chance that Barrick is credible. Not a very heavy lift, I think. But I send my chief geologist, Dr. Larry Buchanan, mm -hmm. out to confirm Mm -hmm. that the roughly 40 million ounces, which was in discussion, was actually there. And he came back and he said to me, um, well, uh, I've had a good trip. And I said, just tell me, is the 40 million ounces <laughs> yeah. there as advertised? And he said, oh, no. And very briefly, right. my heart sank. And he said, no, I see 80 to 100 million ounces. 
And that's just along the eight kilometers that they've done drilling. Now you have to realize that what we talk about today as 40 or so million ounces is from only three kilometers of the eight kilometers that's been drilled. Moreover, that eight kilometers represents less than 5% of the total land package. Mm -hmm. So Larry not only was very upbeat on what he saw in front of us, but his comment resonated with me because he was the one who made the big discovery for me at the beginning of my career in Bolivia, San Cristobal. He said, I think that the next Donlin could be at Donlin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was a variation of a theme on the old adage, if you're going out hunting elephants, go to elephant country. Right. And in fact, his attitude was, I think this could be the new Carlin. Congratulations. And in truth, if you look at the drill results, which uh, the Donlin project has continued to deliver as recently as in November, mm -hmm. Um, they're absolutely outstanding. They're some of the best drill results in the entire gold industry. And those are in areas that had previously not even been drilled, not to mention to depth. So when I look at uh, Donlin, um, I'm always reminded that we think of it as the gift that keeps on giving. It's a very, very special story. And one of the things that most animates me, why I think I so enjoy telling the story when very clearly I could just simply stay at home <laughs> um, is because it's a really exciting story. Uh, I have no doubt that it's the best development story in gold today. But more than that, I like to pose this question to institutional investors. I said, can you give me a gold story that's unique? because I can give you a gold story that's unique. And here's how I define it. In terms of size, mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever been a gold mine that began with 40 million ounces. In terms of exploration potential, we feel that there's a lot more and the drill results are giving us even greater encouragement. In terms of mine life, will be producing roughly a million ounces or so um, over decades, just to begin. In terms of operating costs, mm -hmm. well, when you have a grade that's twice the industry average for gold development stories at over two grams a ton, um, you're going to be in the right zone from an operating cost standpoint. Um, we are uh, enjoying wonderful state support and local community support. They're our best partners. We have um, the fact that it is a truly world-class asset, but located in the best world-class jurisdiction. Alaska is the second largest gold producing state in the United States. That's where you want to be. And when I look at the significance of jurisdictional risk, I am in an unusual position of being able to speak as one of the biggest beneficiaries of the time when jurisdictional risk wasn't factored into the equation. I got into the business in 1993. It was the beginning of the go where the gold is mm -hmm. mentality, mm -hmm. the frontier mm -hmm. mentality. And that took me to Bolivia, Peru, Honduras, Mexico, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Mongolia. I went everywhere. You know, it was the Yanakocha spirit. And it worked for me. I made my first fortune in South America, my second fortune in Africa, Zimbabwe, South Africa. I sold Kibali to Mark Bristow. And then third fortune in North America. Now, when I look at the world, I remember that around the time that I sold our interest in Congo to uh, Mark, um, we were probably the largest holder of mineral rights in the Islamic world. 
from West Africa, Mauritania, Mali, Côte d'Ivoire, Senegal, Burkina Faso, through to being the largest holder of mineral rights in Pakistan. So as an American, other than Bob Friedland, probably I was the most intrepid American explorer. But I also realized that that was going to come to an end, that jurisdiction would go from being something that people gave scant attention to, to being the number one issue. So Tom, I mentioned it's been a hard year for the miners. I'm interested to get your perspective and take on how you see the mining industry, opportunities. Where do we go from here? The gold mining industry is highly challenged. From the standpoint of production, uh, we clearly peaked. Production is down over the last five years. The mining companies are finding it difficult to replace their reserves. Exploration results have been the poorest that they've been in memory. Very, very few uh, quality projects have been developed. Um, by the time a prospect becomes a mine, typically speaking, it's between 15 and 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so if you choose your spots well, with great assets, you'll make a killing. If you compromise on the assets or the jurisdiction, I think you'll get killed. Therein is the opportunity set. This is a challenged industry, but that does not mean that there are not opportunities within it. Great investors like Warren Buffett and Larry Tisch made their fortunes on finding difficult industries, but also finding the diamonds amongst the coal. Well, on that note, I wish you continued success. And you are a fascinating, fascinating person. So I always like to end by talking a little bit about life. And I know you have some kids in college, but when everyone's home seated around the dinner table, what, what do you talk about with them? Do you prepare them for the world as you see it? You know, sometimes I think that as beautiful as our children are, that we basically spawned reptiles. Um, they are a function so much of nature. Their individualism was apparent very, very early on. They have a deep-seated sense of independence. And at the same time, um, they're close-knit. So. What I try to inculcate in the kids from my standpoint, and all credit to their upbringing, to their mother, who is uh, absolutely fabulous. Um, but what I try to inculcate in the kids are values. So you alluded to the fact I have many, many passions. I'm very lucky in that respect. That is for sure nature. Um, almost all of my passions, whether it's for big cats, Rembrandt, antiquities, history, are spawned from a time when um, I was six, seven, eight years old. I'm unusual perhaps in that I have continued with those passions you know, way into my um, adulthood and likely into my dotage, but I don't expect that my kids will share any of those passions to my degree, nor do I really encourage it. What I try to do is to expose them to these interests and then tell them, now you do what you want. However, I do believe that the job for someone like myself is to make sure that they understand what it means to be a good person, that they understand the importance of a purpose-driven life, that they understand that happiness begins with gratitude, which, as Cicero said, is the greatest of the virtue and the mother of all the others. And that I expect them to be honorable, decent people. Mm. And it's interesting you're not, you don't expect or encourage them to follow your footsteps. Not at all. Not at all. 
if for any reason they wanted to, yeah. I wouldn't discourage them. Yeah. However, uh, I am not trying to um, create echoes, but rather give them choices. My parents gave me free reign to pretty much do, study, pursue any interests that I had from a very, very young age. And I think that doing anything else for my kids would be hypocritical. And, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not looking for them to be like me, yeah. but I do want that they will understand the difference between being a good person and not. And that is something where I can hold them to a very, very, very high standard. And I will. Tom, this was just a fascinating conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Danielle. It's absolutely a pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. We hope you enjoyed this in-depth conversation with Tom Kaplan. We'll see you soon. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.